Welcome to the recording of the Bacterial Genome Annotation Tutorials. I'm Berenice Batu. I work for the French Bioinformatic Institute in France. For tutorials that you can find on the Galaxy Training Network, so if you typed on training.galaxyproject.org, here is the Galaxy Training Network page. And if you scroll down and you go to Genome Annotation, and then you will have here a lot of tutorials related to genome annotations. And if you scroll down again and you go to prokaryote section here, then you can click on bacterial genome annotations and here is the tutorials we will follow today. It's normal, it's going down. I have no idea why, but we will fix that very soon. Um, but so if you go again on the top, you will see what are the objectives of these tutorials. So the objective is to identify which genes can be found in the bacterial genomes and which other comp uh, genomic components can be found in the draft bacterial genomes. Uh, for that, the aim is that at the end of these tutorials, you are able to run a series of tools to annotate bacterial, uh, draft bacterial genomes for different types of genomic components, evaluate the annotations, process the outputs to form format them for visualization needs and visualize a draft bacterial genome and its annotations. These tutorials will take some time here, and especially because there is a lot of uh, running times where I will stop the recording while it's running. So what are the objectives? So um, when, after, when you have a new genome, uh, you sequence a new genome, uh, then the first step usually you do is doing an assembly. Uh, that is a separate tutorial that you can all find also on the, on the Galaxy Training Network and that has also a recording. But once you have this uh, assembly, you can annotate the genomes to it. Um, and it's really an essential step to describe the genomes. The genome annotations consist on describing the structures and the function of the component of the genomes. Usually what we do is we predict and analyze and interpret genomic components um, in, to extract their biological significance and to understand, understand the biologic processes in which they participate. So what we do is we identify the genes and also other kind of regions in the genomes so that is called the structural annotations. We could also identify non-coding regions, so it's also part of the structural annotations. And once um, we have the, the location of these components, we determine their functions. So it's the functional annotations. So when we talk about annotations, usually uh, it, it's, it's all together, but there is two, two, um, two parts, it's structural annotations and functional annotations. Today, to illustrate the process to annotate your bacterial genomes, we will take the assembly of the bacterial genomes that has been generated uh, following the bacterial genome assembly tutorials uh, that has been run on data produced by a paper published in 2019 where they sequenced methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus strains. To illustrate uh, the, the process to annotate uh, bacterial genomes, we will use Galaxy. So I recommend you to use one, your favorite Galaxy servers if you don't know which one to follow to use. If you go on the top of the tutorials in, available in these galaxies, you will see which you will see different the known the one that are known to be working with these tutorials, and especially when there is a stars, you can use they probably have exactly the same functions. Today I will use the use Galaxy FR server. So if you oh yeah you can you can go there, um, and yeah here is the use Galaxy France servers. If you go on the top on this small hat here, you will be redirected to the training, to the training website. If you scroll down, oh, what's going on? You scroll down, you go to genome annotation here, and you find bacterial genome annotations. Uh, then you have exactly the same tutorial as before. Uh, so here we will do the um, prepare galaxy. So the first things you need to do is to create a new history. Ah, and sorry. Yeah, if you go on the tutorial, so you have the tutorials. If you go out, you go again on the Galaxy interface. And if you click again, you will be redirected again to the tutorials exactly at the same location where you, you left it. 
So the first thing to do is to create a new history. So you click on this small uh, plus here, create a new history. Then click here on the small uh, pencil here and you will rename that, uh, the new history. So bacterial, we will name it bacterial genome annotation tutorial. Then you click on save and you have a new history. Within this history, then now we can import the contact file that has been generated within the other tutorials. So you could click on copy here. It will copy the link here. You go back to Galaxy, you click on upload data, pass fetch data, and here you can pass the link and click on start and it will upload the contact file within your new history. And I will just pause while it's loading. The contact is now, are now in our history. Uh, so it's a FASTA file with 44 sequences. So if we open it, we have the contact. So we have contact one first with its length and its sequence. And now what we want to do is annotate it. So what we can do, we do that, we will use, uh, there is several tools for doing contact um, annotations and especially for bacterial genomes. Uh, there is Proca and Bacta. Uh, Bacta is now recommended by even the Torsten Simon, the, the um, main developers of Proca, uh, to be the successor, of, the successor of Proca. So we will use Bacta. So it's a tool for rapid and standardized annotation of bacterial genomes and plasmid from both isolate and, and metagenome assembled genomes. So you can use both on individual uh, genomes and also on mags. Uh, if you want. It's a really uh, complete uh, annotation workflow um, and it uh, manages both uh, coding and non-coding genes. How does that work? So here is an overview of the workflow for Bacta. It starts from the top with the assembly, so the context file that we for, uh, we we gave in, in FASTA. It's in the middle, uh, it's doing uh, uh, dealing with coding genes, so it predicts with protocol here the coding uh, sequences and it predicts also a small uh, ORF, so small proteins. Then there is a step of filtering for this uh, for spurious sequences and some overlap of uh, small uh, proteins. Then, so here we do the first step is the structural annotation for the coding regions. Then there is the functional annotations where all these predicted uh, sequences are matched again databases, um, especially UNIREF, RefSec, uh, AMR Finder with different approaches. And then the annotation is then again filtered and then it's done for the coding regions. Then for the, there is some DNA feature that are predicted, look, uh, ORI ORIC, ORIV. Um, and then on the right, you have non-coding genes that are predicted like tRNA, tmRNA, rRNA, and nCRNA, etc. and CRISPR. And then all these uh, features that has been predicted and, annot and annotated are uh, finally uh, filtered for potential overlaps and then the, uh, the outputs are generated in different format depending on what is the aims afterwards. So it's really a complete workflow that annotate both coding and non-coding and predict not only for coding, not only the CDS, but also uh, small proteins. And there is a really comprehensive steps of for the an function annotation. So we will use now Bacta there. So if you click here, if you click directly within the tutorials on the link, you will be, uh, Bacta will be loaded. Uh, the first things you see, it's uh, you need to select the genome in a FASTA format. So here, we, it's already selected. It has already selected the contact files. Then you need to select the the, ref, the database that you want to use. So we will use the last one for the 5.1. Uh, you need to select uh, IMR Finder Plus database that you want. So here is what we want to select. Then uh, in the uh, optional annotations, what we want, we want to keep the original contact headers. Otherwise it renames and if, if for example you had a filtering in the context and the context are not in the in the order like contig one, contig two, contig three, then it will rename them uh, and, and it's then harder to make a cor uh, correspondence between the original context in your FASTA file and what you see in the outputs of Bacta. So I recommend you to keep the original context headers. 
Um, and then in the output, so in the section of the output, we will keep the annotation file in a CSV, so in a, in a table. At the GFF, we will get that in a FASTA. And what we want, we also want a summary as a text and a plot as SVG. And if you click on run the tool, then Bacta will run. And it will take uh, some time, so I will again pause the recording and, and resume when, when Bacta is done. Bacta has finished run. Uh, you have now, uh, we have now five new data in your history. The first one we will have a look at is the summary file text. So what it shows, it shows first information about the sequence, so the length of the sequence, so more than two million pairs, the base pair, the number of sequences, so 44, that was the number of contexts, and some other information, and then we have the no annotations uh, there, so about what Bacta annotated. So the number of coding regions, so more than 2,000 CDS, the small RF, so the small proteins, 22, and also the non-coding regions like the tRNA, 70, uh, 57, sorry, and all those type of RNAs, but also some DNA features like we can find here. So that was also listed in the tutorial, sorry, here, and voila, where it goes again. So that is the first uh, two uh, outputs we looked at. Um, if you see, uh, the result could be slightly different in CDS, yeah, so it's here, it's okay. Um, it's a bit more than what was expected in the original table of the the table of the original paper. Um, in the original paper, we didn't add any information about the proteins. So that is something Bacta uh, did, and we didn't before. Then, we, we if we compare the tRNA, uh, we have slightly lower in Bacta than in the original paper, and but we have more R RNA. And the non-coding RNA, where no information about that. Another file that is created is this uh, feature nucleotide sequences. So it's a FASTA file that contains uh, 2,900 sequences. So it's including then, if we look, it's including the uh, the number is slightly different here because we use slightly different database, but. Uh, so it's a CDS plus ORF plus the tRNA plus the RNA, the non-coding RNA. So all this information that are put into a nucleotide sequence there. Um, so like, uh, yeah, we return tRNA, tRNA, RNA, non-coding RNA, CDS, a small ORF there. Then there is another file that is a table, here summary table, where you have different columns and different type of information. So here you have the context, the type of, of uh, so each line corresponds to a feature. So the line here is the, uh, in, in several, in, in the different columns represent different information for these uh, features. The first column here is the, num the context, and then you have the type, then the start, stop, uh, and some other information about that data. Um, what is stored there? So all information about all the features, all the features uh, that has been identified. And the last and the, the one we will reuse afterwards is this GFF uh, file. So GFF is a standard format in bio bioinformatics. Um, it's it's used in lots of annotation to describe genes and other features of the DNA, um, or also RNA. And it's a tab delimited file with nine fields. So the first one will be uh, the CKD, so the name of the sequence where the features is located, so here the contact. The source, so the which algorithms or procedures have been used to identify this feature. The type, so if it's a gene, an exon. Here you can see if it's a CDS, if it's a non-coding RNA, you are the tRNA. You have also here that it's a region, so it's mean it's back there, so it's here the full context, so the start and end of the full context. You are a regular, regular, regulatory region, other 
Here you see that it's prodigal that has been used, for example, to predict the CDS. Um, blah, blah, blah. So you see that you have a lot of information there. And then you have the start and the stop of the, these features on the gene, on the on the sequence, the score, the confidence with with um, the confidence in, of the source in the features, the strain, the phase, and the attributes. And if you look for the CDS, the attribute is the name or the ID of the sequence, the name of it, so something that is more readable than just the ID. Uh, some other information and also the db the db x-rays which could be uh, some information about for example in which cog it is in which go terms is it associated with which uh, ref sec correspond to that and etc etc so a lot of other a lot of information there <clears throat> how many features are annotated so if we look here we have a lot of lines but a lot of these lines are not about the feature, they are more about the, the sequence, original sequence, etc. So it's why we have more than 50,000 uh, lines there. The last file, and I will not open it because I have issues to open this SVG uh, directly, uh, is uh, an annotation, um, tradition of the circular genome annotations. And what does that represent? So on the external outside your external uh, ring you have the context so here from zero to the top there so and here contig one contig two contig three contig four etc so this is the 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 context then here you have the feature that are annotated with in gray represent the cds if you you have different colors you don't see them direct uh, really well here but you have different colors so here you see a bit more that represent different features. And then two rings here. The, uh, if I'm correct, I always forgot. So the ring here represents the, the sliding window with a GC content, with in green when it's a ball, uh, the mean and in, in yellow, in yellow, sorry, in red when it's below. And then the other, um, the the last ring here is the GCSQ um, there. So Bacta gives us already a lot of information about CDS, RNA, and and uh, other features, but some structural annotation might be missing. For example, plasmids or other interesting features. So we can run external tools then to do that, and we will use Plasmid Finder here to identify and type the Plasmid sequences. Um, Plasmid Finders has a really strong database of hundreds of sequences to predict Plasmid in data. So again, as we did for Bacta, you can click directly within the tutorials to the tools and it will be redirected to the Plasmid Finder within Galaxy. Then you need to select a FASTA file. Um, you need to click on the contig one, so don't be careful of not using the one Bacta provide. Then you need to select a database. Here, please select the last one, so where the date is the, is the more recent date, most recent date, and then you can click on run. And it will take some time, so I will pause the recording and resume once Plasmid Finder is done. Plasmid Finder is now done, so we have four new data sets in our history. We have first the raw result text, CSV text, text file, where we see, uh, yeah, details, uh, the text results. We will not have a look at that, it's too much detail there. We will look at the, the more the TSV file, so the table here, where you have the different uh, plasmid sequences that has been identified. So with which database, the first column, the plasmid uh, information, the identity, the length, the, the some sort of score there, the context, the position of the con on the context, and some notes like the CDF accession numbers. So that is the first things we see there. Um, how many plasmid sequences have been found? So we have six lines, including the either. So we have five uh, plasmid that has been identified. 
where are they located? So they are mostly, if we see here, on counting 19 here. So we have three on counting 19, one on 24, and one on two. Are this was sequence associated with Staphylococcus aureus? So if we look at the accession numbers and we search on NCBI, NCBI, and you search for these accession numbers, you can search that, for example, the first one is associated with Staphylococcus aureus, then this one is more associated with Enterococcus fecalis, this one is more associated with Escherichia coli, and this one, oops, sorry, again Escherichia coli, I mean, it was the same one as here, and this one with Enterococcus. So we have one that is associated with, uh, with um, Staphylococcus aureus. Yeah, and the other one with Enterococcus, which I don't understand is initially I found that it's associated with Staphylococcus aureus, but okay. Um, then what can we conclude about counting 19? So probably counting 19, uh, at least initially thought is could be a representing a plasmid sequence. Um, and if we look this context at the length of 30,000 base pair, which is a similar expected length at the context in table one of the original paper. So that could be still a good candidate for a plasmid this context. Then we have a FASTA file that contains the plasmid sequences. So the sequence that has been identified on the different contexts. And then a FASTA file containing the best matching plasmid genes from the gene, from the database. Sorry. Another thing, so once we identify some plasmid, we could do also a uh, structural annotation of integrants. So integrants are genetic mechanisms allowing bacteria to adapt and evolve rapidly by stockpiling uh, uh, an expression of new genes. An integrin is usually uh, composed of a gene encoding for a specific speci uh, site-specific recombinase, a proximal recombination site, and a promoter to direct transcription of cassette encoded genes. So to uh, detect integrants, we will use a tool that is called Integrant Finder that annotates CDS with prodigal and then in detect uh, independently uh, the integra integrant integrase uh, using uh, HHM profiles and the ATC recombination sites with covariance models and integrate the result uh, to distinguish three types of elements, the complete integrants, the EN elements, or the integral integrase only, and the, the calin, calin elements. So we will integral finder of that. Uh, again, what I did is I click on the link to of integral finder from the tutorials, and that opens the, to, the tools um, directly. And then what we need to do is, again, be careful of selecting the contact files, what we want to do is we want to throw out uh, local locations. We don't have a typology from the history. We want to search also for promoter and ITIC sites. And we will want to remove log files here. And we can run the tools. And I pause while Integrant Finder is running. It should be quite quick. Integrant Finder has finished. So let's look at the uh, so the output, so we have two outputs, and if I look directly at the integrand final annotations, we see that no integrand has been found. So the tools didn't find any integral. And loading there. So there is no integrand finder found there. Sorry, it's always going down. Uh, it could be because the genome is too stable or because the assembly quality is not good enough and some parts useful for integrant finders were removed while doing the assembly. So now another uh, element that we can try to identify are the insertion uh, sequence elements, which are short se DNA sequences that acts as a simple transposable element. Uh, they are the smallest but the most abundant autonomous transposable element in bacterial genomes. 
They code only for proteins implicated in the transpositions activity, and they play uh, a key role in bacterial genome organization and evolution. To detect the insertion sequence element, we will use IZ scan, and it's a highly sensitive software uh, pipelines using uh, uh, Iden marker model uh, uh, that has been constructed from manually created uh, insertion sequence element. So let's run again now Isis scans again by clicking on the tools names and selecting contact there and clicking on running the tools. I will resume it. Uh, Isis scans is quite quick, so that uh, should be uh, not taking too much. So Isis scan is now done. So we are now one, two, three, four, five, six new data sets in our history. Let's start uh, with the First one, let's go with the log file we can skip. Uh, then we have the tables with the result where that looks a bit like a tabular but where the columns are not really well defined. Let's look at the second one, I think that would be more useful. Then uh, here we have the, um, 21 lines, so it means 21 potential uh, insertion sequence elements that have been identified. And so for 20 first, because we have the column, the column either here. Uh, so we have different columns. The first column is the sequence ID, so from which sequence it comes from, the family of the sequence, uh, insertion sequence element, the cluster, where it begins, where it ends, the length, um, and other information there. Um, let me check the result table. And how many sequences have been identified? Look, 20. Where are they located? Are they mostly on which context? And for that, we can use a tool that is called group, group data. Um, and we will do group on the column. So let's go. Uh, so there is a scan result as a table in column one. And we want to count uh, the number on column one. So we want to look at on which context they are. So for that, we will group the data by the column one that the to form groups and counting on that. So how many do how many groups do we form in for that? So that is the first question we wanted to ask. And what are the different uh, insertion sequence uh, family? And for that, we can do the same. Also a grouping on the column on the second column. So we run the same, but on the column two and counting on column two also. So let's run two groups. And we should get results like this, where we know that there is <coughs> insertion sequence element almost on every context. Not all, completely all, but almost there. And counting nine seems to have, again, the most, well, 19, sorry, 19, F3. Um, and that was the one we identified that could have plasmid sequences. And then we have also the insertion sequence family, and we are grouped, and we can see that uh, the 21 have more uh, IS identified on it. So here we have the same information as before that I just showed, that is directly put in the group there. The other things we have is also a GFF file here, the result in GFF again, so that can be used afterwards, or the standard format. And then sequence of uh, the ORF um, nucleotide sequences, so the, the FASTA file with the insertion sequence uh, nucleotide sequencing, the ORF nucleotide sequences that has been identified by uh, Prodigal there. Okay, so we did some structural annotation, extra structural annotations. So we did the structural annotations and functional annotation with PROCA, uh, PROCA, sorry, BACTA. And then we, do ex we did extra structural annotations for identifying plasmin, integrin, and certain sequence elements. What we would like to know to do now is visualize all these annotations using a tool called Gibros, so that we can see in one uh, the annotation from Bacta, the plasmid, uh, the integrin, and the insertion sequence element. But Gibros need annotation in a GFF format. And we saw that Bacta and Isascan generated uh, GFF, but Plasmid Finder and Integrant Finder didn't. 
So we need then um, to see if we could uh, reformat some of the results generated by Plasmid Finder to extract a GFF. And if we look at the result file from Plasmid Finder, uh, let's scroll down, Plasmid Finder, the result TSV file, we see that we have the information there. So we have the database, we have which plasmid, we have on which contact it has been identified, and we have the position of the contact. So we could create somehow a GFF file with that. If we, uh, on the column six, we need to get first the start and the end, <clears throat> we need, we'll need to split that on the board, uh, in between there. Then we could remove the content of the fifth column and keep only the context names here that could be the origin there, the first column on the GFA file. And then we could we need to remove the first line and then transform to a GFF3. That could be possible. So let's do that to create a GFF file from the result file. So the first things we need to do is replace text to be sure to, to split the six columns where you have the two dots and transform that into, uh, to split that, so create two new, two columns instead of one. So that the first part, which is bef before the two dots is a column and the second one is another column. So for that, we will use uh, what is called a uh, regular expression that will uh, define this is my first group, so what is in parentheses is a group. A dot means any characters, with stars mean several times, so how many times? We don't know the number of times. We have a characters, any characters. And then we say, okay, slash, anti-slash, uh, we say that we have a dot. We need to put the anti-slash first uh, to, to say this is really the dot that we want and not this uh, representation of these characters. So we have a first group. Then we have the two dot, and then we have a second group. And then what we want to do is replace the text there by the first group. So that is the, that what we put there. Um, on this slash T means a tabular, so a new column, and then a new the the gone group. So what is there? So it's how we will split the content of the six columns on the three two dots and put in two columns that could be then column two uh, six and seven. And then we want to, so in the column five, to replace and find the pattern, so uh, uh, something that is anything, and then afterwards remove everything that is started with length here. So it's say, okay, we have a first group, but it could be anything, and then we have a second group that starts with the space, and then len dot uh, anything afterwards. And we will replace and keep only what is there. So that will remove the column of the, the content of the first of the column five. So let's do that again. Uh, what we will do that we will do that on the plasmid finder result file and on column six. <clears throat> we want to create two sections, so two 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 groups, and we want to that is separated by two dot. And inside this group, we want to keep. We, we don't know exactly what is inside. We just say, okay, we want every char any character that is several times. And then what we want to do is we want to keep that, separate these two groups by a tabular, so anti slash t. That are first things. And then on the column five, we want, we have one uh, pattern, and then we want something that start with a space length, and then afterward that is anything. Um, and here inside the first group, it can be anything several, how many times until it found this space here. And we want to keep only what is in the first group there. So that is the first things of forming for the replace text on the column. So that will be running. And once we have done that, we will uh, say we want to select last line. So we want to keep only everything that is after. So we want uh, to keep everything af from the line two. I think it's how it is written. Yeah, everything that is after the line two on the column. And we can run that. 
here if we look again what happens we see that on column five it keeps kept only the length of the context and then here it created it split it the column six where you have the two dots by what is in the first tab and afterwards this the end of the sequence here so the select last will keep uh, will remove its first line here and then we can create a table to GFF. So from the output of select, the record or column ID that will be uh, what is now on column five. So the context names, the start will be on column six, the end of column seven. So it are the two columns that we just created. Then afterwards, the type is what you have in column two here. The score or value is what you have in column three. Uh, the source is the databases you have in column one. The strengths we asked it to infer. Um, and then we can insert qualifiers. And sorry again. So the names is what is now on column eight. So it's this column here. So it's column eight. Sorry, eight. And then we can keep also the identifiers here, and I think it's accessions, which could be called accessions, and it's on column nine. And then we it will create a GFF three files from the tables, and then we can add that. If we add integrants, we would have to do that again uh, to create a GFF file from the integrant finders outputs. Here we explained how to do it but we cannot do it right now because we don't have any uh, integrants. So the next things we can do is launching the GBros. I will just wait until the GFF is done. Um, to be sure. I will pause and resume when it's done. So the, now the GFF is ready. So you see that you have now uh, something that looks like a GFF with the sec ID, the, the column names are correctly put on the top here. We have the sec ID, so the, the context, the source, the type, the start end, the strength, and, and the attributes that are the name that, and the accessions here. So you have everything there. So now we can run GBros. Um, what we say we want to use a genome from our history and that will be the config file that has been there. We want to be careful that you use the bacterial archaeal plasmi, plast, plant plastid code. Um, oh, it's 11, yes. Then we need to insert different tracks. So tracks are what is uh, visible. So here every track um, Every tool that has been used for annotations is a different track. So the first track, oh sorry, the yeah, tract is will be called Bacta. We say a uh, track group is Bacta, then we have an annotations. The one we will use is a GF from Bacta. And then here we put can is it canvas features? Sorry. And need canvas features. Uh, for new users, then we create a new group that would be called, um, sorry, got lost, plasmid, plasmid sequences. We add a new track that will be the table to GFF that we just created. Again, we can write features on for new users. And then the last group will be the integrant or insertion sequence element. And then sorry, the track will be the ESA scan outputs. And we keep that only. We have need Canva features on for new users. And then we can run the tools. Or the GBOs will take a bit of time to run there to create the visualization. The browser is now done, so let's open it. So if you click there, you click on the icon, you will see it. Um, what you can do is ID closing the project there. You can click, you need to click on there to load them again. So the tracks you can 
then move them on this side. So here you have the, the top the reference sequence, and then you have the notation for Bacta that is there. Then you have the isoscan, so insertion sequence element, and then the output of plasmid finder. So what are the different questions that we have here? So have all sequence identified by plasmid finders on continent 19 been identified by Bacta? So let's zoom in. Also here. So we see here, and you can click, oh no, here. How can I add that? So plasmid finder has identified three there. And if we see that this one also correspond to this one here, it just uh, the direction. And I think it's during the trans the the way we prepare the GFL that we it's in the direction directions. We have another one that seems to be corresponding to this one here. And then we have a replication protein that is seems to be there. So um all sequence by plasmiders are also fine in the back touch track. Then the next question, sorry, is again for the insertion sequence element. Um, yeah, it's more there. It seems to, there is some correspondence. For example, this one insertion sequence is also from here, like this uh, sequence here. And if we see, we are again in the in the same family. If you see, easy one family here. Um, information seems to be quite similar there. Um, here we have again an easy six here that is from here. And here we have another easy six here. So it seems that uh, Bacta has identified this also insertion sequence element. The only thing that Bacta didn't identify are this, uh, this TRR the terminal inverted repeat that are not identified by Bacta, but only by Isoscan. <clears throat> there is more things you can do with GBOS. I recommend you to look at the dedicated tutorials. So in conclusion, we are at the end of this tutorial. So in this tutorial, uh, contexts were annotated with different tools and then visualized. There is a lot of other visualization that you can do, for example, circles. And there is a dedicated tutorial for that. And if you want to refine uh, the genomization, you can also use Apollo for that. And there is also a dedicated tutorial. So what we did is really we we used uh, Bacta, and that is really a powerful tool to annotate bacterial genomes, and we could visualize them afterwards uh, easily using. Uh, using GPOs and, and understanding the genomic context and help making sense of the annotations. I hope uh, the the tutorials was easy to follow and you enjoyed it. If you if you do please give us feedbacks also here at the end of the tutorials. And yeah, good luck with that.